water faster. Pleasant morning to everyone. Really glad to be here. We're a little bit ano, no? social distancing. <laughs> Super yes. social distancing. <laughs> You're a kilometer away. But we want to be more intimate. No? But uh, first of all, thank you everyone for having us, for having Fintech Alliance today. We're very excited with a host of speakers and panelists that will be joining us. And of course, I'm very fortunate to have with me today uh, two of the movers and shakers in the industry. We have Mr. Lito Villanueva and Ms. Anne Quisha. So let me start. First of all, Lito, thank, congratulations with last week's successful Inclusion and Digital Transformation Summit, or INDEX 2.0. So I wanted to ask you, what are some of the key takeaways that you would like to share with us coming from that you know, successful event? Yes, in fact, uh, we were quite fortunate to have that uh, um, launching of quite a number of uh, initiatives no, during the INDEX Summit 2.0. Uh, by Fintech Alliance in partnership with Enderon Colleges. And uh, one of the key takeaways would definitely be more of how we can further collaborate. And at the same time, how do we now uh, forge that alliances amongst players in the industry towards you know, promoting, further promoting inclusive digital finance. And I think the good news uh, is that you know, of course, we are supporting the government, specifically the Banco Central ng Pilipinas and the Securities Exchange Commission, one of which is definitely the, definitely the Digital Payments Transformation Roadmap, where it has two um, outcomes no? or two goals, where the BSP would want that about 50% of financial, uh, digital financial, sorry, 50% uh, of retail financial transactions must be in the form of digital, and about 70% of adult Filipinos to be part of the formal financial system by end of 2023. And the good news is that we will be able to achieve those twin goals even before end of next year. So, and I think this is uh, a feat where all the stakeholders were able to contribute to in terms of having to achieve these goals. And definitely, uh, you know, of course, during the Index Summit, we were able, we were fortunate to have BSP Governor Medalia, uh, of course, Secretary Mark Villar, who was the uh, Senate Committee Chairman on Banks and Financial Institutions and Currency, and talking about, you know, uh, the pending bill on digital assets. And we've been pushing for that uh, in the Senate, and hopefully by next month, uh, there will be a counterpart bill in the House of Representatives to be pushed by. Uh, Congressman Joey Salceda and hopefully within the 18th Congress we will be able to have that finally to have the digital assets law that will now govern uh, all this uh, you know um, uh, players in the blockchain world so hopefully with all this collaboration uh, and cooperation amongst you know stakeholders we will be able again to achieve that goal of being the blockchain capital of the world Thank you. I think it's really important that we focus on collaboration and it's good to hear that a lot of these exciting initiatives coming from the regulators are happening soon. So we will look forward to that in the coming months. And uh, well, Lita just mentioned, and we've been, we've been hearing this throughout you know, the last few days, that Philippines, it is stated that Philippines is said to be, could be, you know, the blockchain capital of the world. So I just wanted to pick your brain, Anne. What do you think are, you know, the key milestones that we need to achieve as a country in order for us to achieve that? Again, I'm an advocate of um, learning and education. Um, that's why we have intentionally, purposefully built Cadena Hub. Cadena for the, our foreigners means chain. So Cadena Hub, we, we have that situated in Mindanao where we build um, like a, a small academy, some basic short courses for our programmers, for our developers, whether they are, are in-house or coming from others. Um, that, that set of different sessions about blockchain, we, we do this um, on a quarterly basis and we ensure that um, a lot of other fintech startups around the, the, the region of Mindanao will have this capability. So. If we, in, we involve more startups, encourage them to build 
even the slightest and simplest use cases of blockchain technology, I think that is one of the many ways that we can propagate this um, technology around. And so uh, aside from the education, uh, do what, we, what we are doing is some, some sort of alternative, right? But we want that to be mainstream. And to be mainstream, to making sure that it is mainstream, we, we of course encourage that major universities, colleges would embed that as a uh, like major syllabus in, in the courses or even in, in the secondary level of um, our education. So I, I, I think that's the first in terms of milestone. Second would be other fintech startups, even other technological, uh, technology startups would have at least some basic use cases. Don't, um, don't be discouraged to experiment. Just continue to experiment what you can do, what you can build, whether that is decentralized, whether that's private blockchain or whatever. We encourage all of, all of these tech startups to engage and experiment more. Actually, just to add to that, no, to uh, what Anne said, no, I, I think uh, going back to, uh, to this Philippine Blockchain Week, um, which is you know, first of its kind in the Philippines, no, this is the maiden uh, event. And I think that's why we are, you know, we are uh, uh, recognizing the efforts of uh, Donald Lim and, and team for really pushing this uh, to make this a reality. And now we are here. And in fact, uh, I've also um, met quite a number of, uh, you know, uh, foreign entities or you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, attendees no, of this conference, and expressing interest, huge interest in terms of them having to invest in the Philippines. So I would say that this Philippine Blockchain Week now becomes a, a sort of a road show, where you know we are, you know, we are showcasing the the beauty and the huge opportunities that the Philippines can offer to all our prospective investors to invest into the Philippines. And I think this is very much aligned with the government's vision of having to really push for a digital Philippine digital economy that is resilient, sustainable, and progressive. So that's why, again, we commend um, uh, the Philippine Blockchain uh, Week. Of course, we had this uh, oath-taking yesterday of the Philippine Blockchain Council and that is really meant to further educate the public as regards, you know, again, consumer protection, which was actually uh, ampli further amplified by SEC Commissioner Kelvin Lee earlier. So these are the things that uh, the initial benefits of being, of being part of the Philippine Blockchain Week. And again, congratulations to Donald Lim and, and team. Again, a round of applause for, this, for Donald and, uh, and team. So we talked about a lot of the key pillars for us to achieve digital transformation, achieve financial inclusion. And uh, BSP's Governor Medalia mentioned that these three pillars include uh, digital payment streams, digital financial infrastructure, digital governance and standards, right? And as leaders in your respective industries, Lito and uh, what are some of the key initiatives that align or support these pillars? Yes, I mean, I'll start with, uh, of course, um, uh, wearing my hat as RCBC now, uh, just to provide some, uh, some examples on how we are also supporting uh, the government in terms of promoting uh, inclusive digital finance. So, in, in so far as those three pillars are concerned, I mean, for example, what we have actually um, done thus far is the launch of uh, this Cartec, which is the, the Philippines' first multilingual app that is meant, uh, that is uh, practically in Taglish and in Cebuano languages uh, at the height of the hard lockdown in uh, July 2020. And also uh, having to uh, roll out um, RCBC Manibela Barangay and Banking, the whole idea is to provide that banking services, not banks, but banking services or financial services in every, in every barangay, which practically now numbers about more than 42,000 of them, and as well as the RCBC ATM Go that is uh, also the largest uh, and the first in the country for uh, the Kapit Bahay or neighborhood or community uh, mobile POS uh, ATM, where more than 60% of the transactions are 
disbursements for CCP Pantawid Pamilya Pilipino program uh, household beneficiaries. And in fact, um, for this CARTEC alone, we were able now to achieve uh, a, a four-digit growth rate year-on-year -year in terms of transaction value and volume, as well as exponential growth in terms of uh, user base. And in just a matter of 30 days from the time that we launched it, there were about a million app downloads in less than 30 days. And the thing is that uh, even RCBC ATM Go, we're the only bank now that has the most extensive reach using that device present in all 82 provinces. And in fact, for this, uh, and uh, in terms of revenue, because practically when you talk about digital, the ultimate question will always be, is it something profitable, right? Especially in pushing for digital transformation. But I'm pleased to, uh, to tell you that this is a, use, this is a, a case study where in the five-year KGAR, revenue KGAR of uh, one of our digital platforms called RCBC Digital, which is the mobile app for the mass affluent, we re registered a, re a five-year revenue KGAR of 132%. And for ATM Go, which was also uh, for five-year revenue KGAR of ATM Go, it registered 82%, uh, sorry, 83% uh, uh, five-year revenue KGAR. And, and for this month alone, November, we will be able to uh, uh, record the highest transaction value uh, or volume for RCBC ATM Go alone, for the mobile POS. That's amazing. That's actually 1.2 billion pesos, purely from the barangays. I mean, and that's something that we are really very proud about. And also, in partnership with Grocery, we're able to onboard more than 20,000 uh, Sari Sari stores to enable them with the QRPH capability. And with that partnership, we will be able to uh, push for 10x of the current uh, deployment or activation or enablement this month to about 200,000 by next year. So again, collaboration for impact is critical for us to be able to promote inclusive digital finance. Thank, Thank you. you, Lito Ann. Yeah. Our modest efforts in trying to digitalize cooperatives has allowed us to reach at least 600 cooperatives to date from the last. Um, we, we launched our DigiCoop, uh, the digital cooperative platform, last during the pandemic, 2020, uh, all during webinars and all of that. Um, and we are able to convert their almost 500 physical branches and that used to be some sort of a very simple cooperative center, now becoming a payment center and a logistics center. All through uh, all these fintech products that we have launched. So that, that's our modest um, contribution um, in as far as digital, digital and financial inclusion is concerned as one of the major um, push of our government and what, who we are covering is really the, the most challenging sector of the country in terms of um, being able to explain digitalization is something uh, that's already challenging and to um, enabling them to use digital tools is the next challenge. And, but um, we are seeing uh, some sort of success little by little, month on month, year on year, and I was just uh, in a Congress, Cooperative Congress yesterday, where I spoke about the new technology that we have just recently rolled out. The first uh, QR-based te um, teller machine, uh, which several dozens of cooperatives are... This is CoopNet. Yes, okay. this is CoopNet, or Cooperation Network. This is not um, exclusive to cooperatives, but as the, the name... Uh, speaks its cooperation network. This is also for World Banks and other financial institutions in the countryside who cannot afford the basic ATM. Um, since it's not using a bank switch or a switch of the bank, it's much more cheaper in terms of transaction fees and their CAPEX and their OPEX. So that is uh, what we mean by inclusive or inclusion. We make, every, we democratize these technological tools and access to the, the payments and our, at our NRPS uh, be made available to any institutions. Again, our motto is always enabling the enablers. Actually, just to add, I, for, I forgot to mention this. Uh, in fact, again, 
I think you, you may recall uh, that uh, that was actually the biggest announcement uh, made during the Singapore FinTech Festival, the uh, investment made by Sumitomo to RCBC about, uh, uh, with an approximate amount of about, about 460 million US dollars, uh, increasing their earlier 5% equity stake in, the, in RCBC to about fifth, to another 15%, uh, making it 20% stake. No? So we now, RCBC is now an affiliate of Sumitomo. And that is, in a way, a, a sign of confidence uh, in so far as provide, because, because of, of course, confidence in so far as having to push for digitalization in, in, in the company. At the same time, uh, I think another sign of confidence is that the, uh, the amount paid was actually 3x of the share price during the time that it was actually closed. And in fact, 1.5x of the previous 5% uh, equity infusion. So this is again uh, a premium, and uh, and of course yesterday, uh, just yesterday, we also launched the first uh, bills pay uh, PH, we are enabling uh, national billers to be able to uh, put their QR code, QR PH codes, the interoperable QR PH codes in all their uh, electronic statements of accounts or billing statements, where any bank or wallet that could actually scan those QRs can now be read, can now, can now be, be able to be paid. Uh, and that, is, that was actually uh, an initiative uh, by, by the BSP. So all of these things uh, would de definitely redound to the benefit of the public. And again, within the context of us pushing for a uh, digit, uh, Philippine digital economy. Financial inclusion is very multi-dimensional. Multi I'm sure everyone here would agree. But at its most basic level, it has to start with opening an account, right? And you mentioned, Vito, that we will be able to achieve by next year, well ahead of the target, reaching 70%. And we have to admit that some of our far-flung cities or municipalities have yet to be reached, right? Um, there no, there's no presence of branches or any, any brick-and-mortar uh, bank to service their financial needs. What are some of the challenges? You've talked about Coopnet. Uh, you have this car tech from RCBC. Uh, I I'd probably twist the question a bit and explain to us some of the challenges that you see in achieving uh, you know, all of these far-flung areas in the Philippines to really promote financial inclusion and make sure that no one gets left behind. Well, the number one uh, barrier has always been uh, data infrastructure, right? Uh, we all know for a fact that far-flung areas, I mean, the, the, they call it GIDA, the, uh, geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas. These are the, you know, uh, the remotest uh, barangays or sitios uh, in, you know, um, coastal towns, uh, rugged terrains, etc. And, in fact, that has been one of the priorities of the BSP. And, in fact, uh, if I may, if I can recall, there was an executive order signed by the former president Duterte on providing for satellite broadband uh, for, for these communities uh, other than the, the major telcos that we have, right? But on top of that is the, that we are thankful that we are the first in Southeast Asia to have uh, the Starlink of Elon Musk uh, to be to be deployed in the Philippines, but that is yet to be deployed, yes, because that is in partnership with the ICT, and uh, that that's one. And second would be, of course, that has been one of the major barriers before, but I think until now it is, uh, which is the you know the full uh, deployment of the national Philsys ID, right? Because the problem now is that you yes you have been you have actually registered for national ID, but you still have that paper slip or the acknowledgement receipt. But that is not yet accepted if we are to uh, be onboarded and to, be, to have a, a, a transactional account because they still need that physical plastic uh, that will be issued to you by the government or by, uh, uh, by uh, Philippines and Texas Authority. So in the third item is again education, right? Because there is still that uh, notion by most of the special senior citizens or even uh, in far-flung areas about how secure are we in terms of having to trust the system in terms of us putting our money inside the, you know, practically the, in the mobile device, right? So because you still have that fear amongst them that, you know, uh, uh, delayed uh, uh, transfers or um, 
um, you know, uh, and, uh, and other, and other um, issues. No? So again, education is key. That's why in the FinTech Alliance, that has always been our priority in terms of providing that awareness campaign in, uh, in partnership with the regulators. And again, the issue on cybersecurity, the issue on uh, all this uh, hacking, phishing, smishing, etc. That has been part of, uh, of, the, of the journey. That's why everybody in the, in the industry um, is united towards that direction of us being able to provide that, uh, that, that education or awareness uh, campaign amongst Filipinos. And look, I know Lito and I were talking earlier how committed you are and pretty much going all around the country, visiting a lot of these uh, you know, municipalities and cities. Tell us about you know, some of the, the conversations that you have uh, with uh, the, these areas, uh, as Lito coined earlier, the GIDA. Right? Yeah. So I, uh, first and foremost, the, the three major challenges that Lito mentioned, I am a witness to all of this. Like, first, the internet. I would go to as far as Kidapawan and some barrios in Kidapawan, and I would see cooperatives who's very efficient in what they are doing in terms of um, rice milling or rice processing, for example, and be able to provide loans to their farmers, to their farm managers, but they log their transactions in a blue logbook and index cards. I cannot believe myself when I saw it two years ago. And this is the only, uh, the, the biggest barrier in digitalization is that infrastructure. And we could really hope that uh, our government, and I'm sure the ICT has had several programs in the past, even under the sec, uh, leadership of Sequio and, and now uh, under uh, Senator Gringo Honas and, and, and the new um, Secretary Uwe, right, Ivan Uwe. Um, in, in the propagation of the Wi-Fi connectivity or internet connectivity. So these are real world case. These are world scenarios that we, 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 can, we can only imagine. Here in the metro, we are not experiencing. Everything is like theoretical for us. We could see this in some form of research data and some, some news, but we do not experience such a thing. But when you are there, um, you would see that, okay, how can we even talk about blockchain here? Everything is on block, in, in log books and index cards. So the, these are real challenges. The second that um, Dito mentioned would be still the identity. I went as far as um, some areas in Bukidnon where there are datus, uh, like uh, small chieftain and, and that... that uh, govern certain uh, municipalities and, and um, as organizations in, the, in their communities. They would have um, these indigenous people without identification who could change their name today and the next week would be a different name because they, don't, they lack that. Um, to only introducer, the term introducer allows these uh, indigenous people to have some sort of credibility uh, with the small community, to be able to mingle, be able to borrow money, be able to have access to, uh, to other financial services. That's through introducers. So the digital ID or our FILSIS plays a very, very important role. How can we be able to ascertain the identity of a person without that? And also, if I may add to that as my sub one, sub two, sub one, not just the identity, but also um, the, the, the SIM registration. Because mostly, we cannot force bank accounts yet to these 40 plus, 40% 40 of the Filipinos. But um, most of them would have cell phones. But the, that SIM registration is very critical in allowing, at, at the very least, have some form of identity eh, because most of the wallets are using mobile numbers as their accounts to the wallet, right, as for, for their financial access. So that, that's a, another key. And of course, this education. Um, 
we encourage more startups not just to build tools, but to also uh, um, have, have more means and tools to educate our people in wherever they are, whether they are in Cebu, in, in Palawan, or wherever. Take this opportunity to always educate our, our fellow countrymen about technology because, again, this is our way forward. There's no other way but to go um, digitalize the, the entire Philippines. Thank you, Anne. In closing, um, I just wanted to maybe get your thoughts or a vision of how a financially inclusive Philippines will look like or perhaps what the success look like, whether this happens in the, in the short term or the medium term, hopefully in the short term, that's the objective. But tell us your vision. What, is, what, is, what does that look like? Or paint us a picture. I think my key takeaway here uh, would be summed up to just one word, no? and that is trust. No? trust. Because uh, and trust, I would, have, I would put an acronym to trust. I mean, that's, that is technology that is responsive, universal, secure, and transparent. Trust. Thank you, Lito. Um, aside from trust, I would say people will, will have that if they feel secure. If, if the security in terms of regulatory, in terms of standards, uh, infrastructure, protocols that we use, rules and regulations that we uh, um, create in order to um, roll out certain products will be really in place and people would have that confidence. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to be politically incorrect whenever I am with a banker because I'm also a former bank. I'm also a former RCBC employee. Um, but with the experience that I had with the grassroots, I would say being unbanked doesn't mean being unserved. They could be underserved, but that's why the rise of many wallets and giants, uh, giant wallets and other um, technology companies are here for because we would like to address this gap in our society. And with, with um, all these innovations that we are rolling out, implementing in the Philippines, we would like to really reach out to the poorest of the poor and be able to make them included, be, make them part of our financial services whether in the form of banking technology or wallet technology, we want everyone to be included. And I think that is only achieved when we have um, the proper protocol, security, and trust in what we, we do. Thank you so much. And with that, a big round of applause from our panelists today, Lito Villanueva and Anne Quisha. See you next year.